Hello, everyone, and welcome to Off Ice, episode number one. I'm Ted Barton coming to you from Vancouver, Canada, along with Mark Henry, joining us from Nottingham in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Mark. Great to see you back and great to share the airwaves with you. See you again, Ted, too. And we spent so much time together last year on the Junior Grand Prix circuit, and I've been excited to get back to that. So this is a nice little precursor to our work together on the Junior Grand Prix. Yeah, a little promo for that, Mark. Of course, we're going to be starting in just a few weeks in the Bangkok. Uh, I think it was August 8, uh, 24th, I think it is, that our first day on Thursday. And we've got seven weeks of coverage for you coming from all over the world. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in this broadcast. Now, we're going to discuss the rhythm dance for this season, the 1980s, certainly memorable in so many ways. We'll have some fun with that. Um, but um, where were you? When were you born? <laughs> so I was born in 85. So my awareness of the 1980s uh, wasn't the best, but like all of the skaters that are uh, going to be competing this season, I've had to do some research just as they have to, to better familiarize myself with the 80s and what the essence of the 80s was and is. And it's been uh, an interesting fact-finding study. And I realized that the 80s really was um, quite a special decade. Well, no question. Well, I was uh, actually, I'm not going to tell you how old I was then, but <laughs> it's in my prime. But no, yeah, that era was just full of uh, consumerism and materialism. I just remember not owing much, but wanting everything. It seemed to be that was kind of the decade. It was the decade of greed, as they call it. Things, little things like the Walkman. Now we have uh, the ear, ear pods that you have in right now working on this. And uh, some of the Things the material of those days, velvet, velour, and polyester, uh, big cell phones, massive cell phones of those days. The start of computers uh, were starting to enter the homes, of course. They say back in the 1980s is making a comeback in 2023 with bold colors and quirky patterns. I'm not wearing that stuff. And <laughs> on self-expression, well, that's good. That's going to be good for, for dance for sure. TV television started made a large impact in those days as well. Audio um, and music videos, of course. And a nationwide survey uh, said that 80% had been voted that it was the best decade for music. Wow, that's going to be good. Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins were two truly uh, big, important catalysts in the 80s music. Michael Jackson, of course, in 1982, uh, wrote Billie Jean, one of the great recordings in pop history. And some of the more famous 80s stars, Michael Jackson, of course, Madonna, Freaking Mercury, ah, awesome, Whitney Houston, Prince, George Michael, Bruce Springsteen, and the great Tina Turner. Now, we're going to see a lot of great music this year, Mark. Looking forward to it. Yeah, interesting when you mentioned like the cell phones, the computers, and how things have obviously evolved and changed. But yet, when you mention the musicians, I think that music stands just as you know just as good stead now all these decades and years later um not so much for the cell phones i think we've, we've evolved a little bit from that point yeah and it's gonna be interesting to see how this younger generation takes something a generation they never knew do the homework thank gosh for google i guess you know and searching of course and seeing the different you know styles of music and costumes and whatnot and we're going to witness this on the junior grand prix how well they learned what that era was all about. And then also with the judges, not easy. Some of those judges may not have been born then either, or, you know, were you very young during that time? So anyways, let's get going on the rhythm dance. Let's talk a little bit about the rules. I know you and I talked a little bit off air about how interesting it is to, on the compulsory port, portion, the uh, rock or fuck rock is changing the role. So the man has escaped the women's role, the woman has escaped the man's role. Talk to me a little bit about yeah. that. Absolutely. So that's going to take place for the juniors that are competing and they'll be dancing the Rocker Foxtrot, a dance which I haven't actually checked the, the year of its creation, but a dance known by so many ice dancers for, for such a long, long time. But not before has it been done where the woman skates the man's steps and the man skates the woman's steps. So it's I've heard um, lots of people discussing it because it's a, a fairly, it seems like a monumentous shift and in, in, in something new and i've heard lots of people maybe not so positive about it because as is the case with so many hobbies when you've got um used to something some people are a little bit scared of change and this is obviously extremely different to what we're used to but i think it's quite exciting quite interesting and already we've seen a couple of competitions happen the, the lake placid ice dance event has just taken place and the results at that event show that 
it is much more difficult for the man so far to achieve the key points than it is for the woman when they do the same steps. And there could be a multitude of reasons for that. And it's going to be interesting to see throughout the season how that unfolds and how skaters get more and more used to skating in a different position than they have been used to before. Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting part of the dance, but also in the step sequence is a no-touch step sequence. Now, that was brought in so because not all the uh, teams are equal in skating ability, and therefore when you separate as a, a as partners and have to skill, uh, skate side by side, of course, you're going to show your strengths and your weaknesses in comparison to your partner. So the step sequence has that, but also the uh, pattern dance portion has it as well, having to switch the role. So we're going to start to see or unveil the strengths and weaknesses of each part of it. Interesting indeed. Of course, for Twizzle, there's always uh, uh, a big uh, risky element, but we don't see a lot. Well, in junior, maybe a few more mistakes, but, you know, it's just remarkable um, how difficult that element is, but how well it's done, particularly in seniors. Yeah, and as is, is so often the case for the dancers, that level four, to achieve level four in the twizzles for both the man and the woman isn't out with the realms of comprehension for, for most teams, even at the junior Grand Prix circuit, but it will be the grade of execution which will really separate the, the teams um, amidst the pack. And I think with every passing year now, everybody gets more and more familiar with the judging criteria and the, the positive features that they're striving to achieve to, to boost that grade of execution. And it will be the skaters that have really, you know, analyzed the rule book and know exactly what the, the judges are looking for to achieve the plus these plus fours and maybe even the occasional plus five to really secure a big tech score. Let's talk a little bit about the lift and, you know, the short lift is seven seconds. Now you're in dancing on ice, uh, that professional show, you probably have like 35 second lifts. You know, so, <laughs> you know, but how hard is it to change, to all the change of positions to get that lift done within seven seconds? It, it, it can be a, a challenge. And we used to see more before they increased the length of time allocated to the dancers in the short lift, we used to see the extended lift violation happening more. Now we don't maybe see it as much, but for the juniors as opposed to the seniors, they may be pushing not just for attaining level four, which again, isn't, I say it's not too difficult. Of course it's difficult. To get a level four is, is the highest level, obviously, and that's challenging. But what I suspect we will continue to see is not just skaters striving for level four, but going for um, features in their lifts that are more likely to get a good grade of execution, going for things that are just that little bit more challenging, more impressive, to, to, to push the judges to go higher on, on the GOE. And that's where we could fall into problems. And especially that will be more likely to be prevalent in the early part of the season. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about the music now that we've seen in recent years, remastered music. There's some wonderful uh, services around the world now that do a brilliant job at taking um, perhaps a classical piece or a contemporary piece and remastering it, changing it a little bit um, and I think we're probably going to see that here. Let's talk about the rules uh, in regards to the rhythm itself. Now, you've spoken to some people. To get a little bit more background on that. Yes, yeah, so the, the communication that the Ice Dance Tech Committee released, communication number 2560, they've got a paragraph citing what, what they're looking for and the theme selected for the rhythm dances for both junior and senior for the season 23-24 is music and feeling of the 80s. Any music is possible provided it was originally released in the decade of the 1980s, the couple should demonstrate through dance the culture and feeling or essence of this decade. And the selected music may be remastered. Um, and then on the back of that, I've been in touch with some members of the Ice Dance Technical Committee, and they said that any new version of the chosen song must have been released within the decade of the 80s, but most important that it fulfills the essence of the 80s. So whatever that may be, and that... Um, you, you mean whatever that means, essence, in regard, because isn't that a little bit of a judgment? Yeah, a little bit. And I, on the back of that, then I, I googled and researched as the, the coaches, the choreographers and the skaters will be doing, you know, what, what would the, the, the essences, the nuances of dance styles within the 80s and on the back of that, I threw up a whole host of different things and the iconic dance move would be the dirty dancing lift. Um, but also break dancing. I didn't realize that break dancing was such a, a prevalent part of dance culture within the 80s and so it will be really interesting to see who has done almost the most research i was always really fascinated by when papadakis and Cezeron did the whacking that they used um on route to winning the olympic gold medal and the, the obvious research they had done in that dance style it'll be interesting to see how much thought process and and 
um, research teams will do. And maybe we'll, we'll be more likely to see that kind of attention to detail in the seniors because we have to assume that the juniors are still in their earlier developmental stage where more of their training time has to go into fundamental skating skill and maybe just amassing level four. So maybe that's something that will be attributed more to in the, in the seniors. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch uh, the juniors and how they, you know, sort of adapt the, adapt to the 80s era and the essence of the 80s. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, a lot of them are just, uh, you know, still learning the skating skills and strengthening those um, very important basics. Uh, so that'll be fun to watch. Uh, that's uh, some of the m- music that's being used this year. Let's talk about that. Nadia Bashinska and Peter Beaumont. From Canada, they were the Grand Prix final, Junior Grand Prix final champions, and they were uh, world medals, uh, junior world medals last year. They're going to be skating to Never Tear Us Apart by uh, NXS, uh, Wild Boys by Duran Duran, and uh, the choreographs by Caroline and Juris Mazguliev. Phoebe Becker and uh, James Hernandez from Great Britain using Prince, and that's going to be awesome. Uh, Nicholas Buckland and Perry, Penny Coombs uh, doing the choreography there as well. Um, some others here, Hannah Lim, Ye Kwan from Korea, medalists as well last year in the juniors, skating to a medley of songs by Prince. There's just a couple, just a, a little bit of taste, if you will, for the uh, music that's being chosen at the senior level. And I think it'll be, in the past, I've heard complaint and critique when it comes to rhythm dance, when there's the likes of tango. And obviously last year on juniors, we had tango and couples and teams, coaches and choreographers will so often go for the, you know, the diehard classics because they're brilliant pieces of music. Whereas this year, um, with it being such a wide spectrum of choice, we're going to be treated to a whole host of different um, musical choices, which is going to be exciting. And I think hopefully more spectator friendly as well. So that has to be good for the sport and good for, for the Ice Dance Technical Committee to think of something that we haven't seen before because that's you know, moving with the times and, and, and keeping... Um, hopefully audiences engage with, with sport. Okay, so question for you, Mark. If uh, you're an ice dancer, you're still competing in ice dance and dancing on, on ice, of course, in Great Britain, um, and you're competing this year, let's say you're on the juniors, what music are you picking for this rhythm? Oh, wow. Interesting that you said, because obviously we've got a list of some of the um, the pieces that people have already publicly released that they're using. And I would be akin to using Prince. I love the music by Prince, but now on this little list we've got, we've seen When Dubs Cry, we've seen you know other skaters and teams already going for that. And so I would be somewhat reluctant perhaps to go down a route that others are, are more likely to choose because then there's going to be that constant comparison. Also, you have you run the risk then of, of making judges, oh, there's the same track again. Um, I think I would have loved to have thought of Tina Turner, but then have... There's always going to be that comparison with others. So the ideal would be that you can find something that's brilliant, but a little off the wall removed. And, and that's where the, the research the teams have to do in the off season is so crucial to find the optimal music choice. One that the teams love, one that their training makes love too, because that's going to give good vibes for everybody. And one that's going to be judge friendly as much as is possible. And ideally not just too overused because Rightly or wrongly, I think there is a preconceived, you know, when you hear Carmen played again, you go, oh, Carmen. Um, and so I think that's that's just something that has to play into the music choice. So in answer to your question, I don't quite know. I'm probably glad that I don't have a decade's worth of great music to use. I was going to say, you really dodged that question. Amazing. No, I, what a killed work as a costume with the 80s music. Uh, yes, something where, um, yeah, something where I could don a kilt. Yeah, that, that would work. Yeah, okay, you're a real fence sitter on the music choice. Okay, well, I'll talk to you a little bit later on in the Junior Grand Prix. Well, we've heard a lot of the music. What's going to be your favorite tune that you've heard so far? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Mark, we got some Q&A to end this uh, episode number one on Off Ice. Uh, my question to you, uh, what do you, um, this uh, comes from uh, fans around the world that have sent in some questions for us on the show. Um, what is it that you most uh, like about covering on the junior grammar? Well, obviously it's working with the great Mr. Ted Barton. And I think also in addition to that, obviously it's just being able for me to be back at rinkside again, because prior to joining you last year in the junior Grand Prix, the commentary I'd done had been, um, done from a studio setting in London, and I wasn't um, 
whilst I loved doing the commentary before that, I was missing out on practice sessions. I was missing out on getting the chance, the opportunity to chat to skaters and get a little bit more back feedback. Um, and, and also the chance to see the humanity of the skaters as well. I think I competed, my last competition was 2010 and I disconnected a little bit. And then coming to commentary, you, you forget, it's easy to forget that these are humans. Um, and so it was really wonderful to just get back rinkside and see the human aspect of our sport. Yeah, and I just to follow up on that, I think it's great. You know, I love covering the juniors because they're so innocent. I don't know if the innocent is the right word, but they're so pure in their passion and such great joy to represent their country finally on the ISU circuit. And, and their eyes are big and it's so much fun to watch them and, and uh, to see the success and to support them through the tough times as well. So I love that part of it. Yes, so for you, Ted, if you could change any rule in the judging system, what might that be? Well, for sure. This is the big one for me. I've always wanted to do this. We, you know, thought of this in the very beginning, having been involved in uh, developing the system back in uh, 20, um, in 2002, 3, 4, and 5, was having three panels. Because I think that the job of judging and I've watched enough skating and been on technical panels myself and watch so much skating that there's so much detail, such wonderful detail that it's very difficult for one mind to be 100% accurate on all aspects that are required of the judge. It's not criticizing the judge at all because they themselves are just human as well. It's a very impossible task. So I love the fact they got a technical panel, love to see a GOE panel focusing and just on the quality of each one of those technical elements. And then of course, a group of experts in the PC a panel as well. I'd love to see that. I know they've done some tests on that, and I know they're continuing to do tests on that, and I'm not so uncertain that that won't be the future at some point. We'll see. It's up to the ISU, but that's one of the rules I'd like to see change. Uh, Mark, talking during performances of Junior Grand Prix versus Senior Grand Prix, what are your thoughts? So, again, prior to joining you on the JGP, I had... I wasn't quite sure when I first did commentary, I wasn't given any uh, hard and fast rules as to what we could or couldn't say. So I just kind of followed along with what I'd heard of others and chipped in when I felt it was necessary. Um, but obviously in the Junior Grand Prix, we elect not to speak at all. And having done that, and then having seen some of the, the reviews and the feedback from that, I sense that a lot of the skating fans around the world really appreciate that just let the skating do the talking. That said, for uh, the seniors, where um, our feed is, is, is given to TV but is an obligation to educate a little bit more with some vocal throughout the performance. Yeah, that's exactly what happens in the Senior Grand Prix. We, we've been instructed by uh, people who sell the rights to these uh, networks around the world um, that there are perhaps a different um, audience. They're not such so passionate maybe or they're not, you know, they're watching on television Saturday night, whatever. They need a little bit more guidance. So that's why you hear us say a little bit during those uh, senior Grand Prix, we, we're kind of required to do so. We try to keep it to a minimum. On the junior, we have control on that. And as you mentioned, let the uh, skating speak for itself. So a question coming in. It's an interesting one, a good one. What can the International Skating Union do to gain more interest in figure skating? Well, you know, a lot's got to do with what's happening around the world, of course. And and uh, this, these are challenging times, of course. But the ISU has... I think with the Junior Grand Prix was a, a great initiative uh, in order to, uh, because it's on the internet and everyone can access it. Not unlike uh, in the Senior Grand Prix, not everyone can see the Senior Grand Prix. So, uh, because television rights. So I think that initiative was very good. We've, uh, uh, countries from around the world are joining now. Uh, uh, Egypt, we saw join uh, last year, maybe it was the year before. And, um, you'd be surprised at how many countries are actually members of the ISU now, and fans are starting to write in from all over the world in countries that are, don't even have a rink because they now have access to it. So I think that was a very good initiative. Their social media department as well is doing a great job. So um, I, I don't know, other than exposure, how um, how you can increase the size of the audience immediately. People have to fall in love with the sport. Then they have to fall in love with the, with, with the athletes and their stories regardless of whether they're the winners or whether they're in 35th place in juniors. doesn't matter. What is their story? Where are they from? How did they get there? And that's a bit of the storytelling, which is what we do a little bit on the Junior Grand Prix. So 
I think the ISU is trying to do the right thing at this time. I, I really believe in that. There may be things coming up in the future that will change the dynamics of this and make it that much more interesting and include a newer audience. I don't know. We'll see. I think they're working on it. This I know for sure. This week, we'll start the Junior Grand Prix in Bangkok, Thailand. I'll be there live. Mark will be at his new studio at home in Nottingham. We'll be covering the next seven weeks, the Junior Grand Prix. Well, that concludes episode one of Off Ice. Next up, Coach's Life. Make sure you join us for that. <laughs>